Hello and welcome to One Take. I'm Dale Kirshner. Today I'm talking with Liz Dietrich, CEO and founder of Dietrich RPM, which stands for Research Propelled Marketing. Liz, welcome to One Take. Thank you. Thanks for including me. Glad you're here. Uh, you know, you've had uh, a really interesting time talking with people. You've also been involved in a study and just I'm looking forward to talking with you about two different things today. One, what you're hearing about from everybody out there and the study. And then two, what you've been going through with your firm. And let's first start out with that manufacturing industry study. Uh, sure. Tell us a little bit about that and what you learned from it. Sure, I'm on the board with TSMA, which is Tri-State Manufacturing and MMA. And we, I wanted to be able to help uh, them understand what was happening to our members. So we sponsored the study and we reached out to um, AFMA, CMMA, and Tri-State um, manufacturing members. And we excluded it to only manufacturing to understand what, what's happening. What are they doing different? What are they doing creatively? How is, uh, how is this pandemic impacting their business? So um, we did that and then we wanted to be able to share any new ideas that people were leveraging as a result of this with other members and then also just get a feel of the pulse and what, what's going to happen in terms of long-term um, operational issues. So um, what did you find? You know, what, what uh, are they doing that's, that's working and what are some of the differences you found uh, when it comes to what some are doing and some aren't? So, you know, what the good news is, is that 70% of the respondents felt that they'd adopted well. Um, they had, um, it, it had changed the economy, however, and um, businesses with less than 100 employees were not faring as well as those who were larger companies. So that was the other thing that we found. So there's a little di disparate differences in terms of that. I didn't really see anybody doing something uh, fundamentally different. So going out and um, offering a new type of uh, manufacturing process, um, there were very few that were, you know, doing something that was really innovative. So that was a little, um, little surprising. I expected to see more um, on that level. Um, and one thing that was really hard to see is that, you know, they're operating at 60% capacity because they have to. And uh, um, as a result, you know, the smaller ones are going to have a tougher time making it for more than a year at that, um, at that capacity. Um, you know, and, and some of the people on my board are saying that they, they still have people at only 32 hours because they can't bring them back full time yet. So there's been um, a cascading impact to that. One positive thing, though, is that I, I, we saw that more people were um, sourcing within the United States and not relying as much on China, which was good to see. Um, so that, that was uh, one other positive thing that we found out about it. Yeah, very interesting. If people wanted to get, uh, uh, take a look at that survey, where could they find it? Um, if they want to see the white paper, they can go to TSMA. It's right on their website. They can get it. Great. Uh, is that, what, what's the website name? Tri-State Manufacturing. Dot com? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. What else are you hearing out there? Uh, maybe from, from clients and, and others in terms of how are they overcoming uh, some of the challenges that have been uh, brought about by the COVID-19 situation? Well, I think if, it, you know, what, what I'm seeing is kind of two paradigms. You know, some leaders are just buckling in and, and not really, um, exploring other ideas or ways to be uh, proactive and perhaps think about ways that they can maintain. You know, I understand every business is different and of course hospitality has had a very tough time. Um, but I, so that's one paradigm. And, and again, it, it's really not just exclusive to, of course, hospitality. It's a kind of a mindset. And then there's the other mindset where I'm seeing leaders uh, be more open and agile and scrappy and wanting to uh, be thinking outside the box in terms of what they can do to uh, continue to thrive. And as a business leader, we're expected to be um, there's a, there's the perfect, uh, 
quote, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And we're expected to do that. But we're, we're also expected to plan for what's next. And this is a tough time to plan for what's next. So again, I think if you can be, find a way to continue to be innovative, if you have the bandwidth, this is the time to, to make, to make uh, or take advantage of that. I think what you all good points, but the words you just mentioned, if you have the bandwidth, is part of what I'm wondering about with that first group, the mindset you were talking about where they really haven't changed. Um, do you think it's because they just don't have the capacity? They're, they're trying to just keep, um, keep things going right now? Or do you think it's a, a stubbornness um, and kind of this, this belief that things will snap back here within six to 12 months? And heaven forbid they change too much right now because as things come back, uh, everything will be fine. Yeah, it's a good question. I think how I'm seeing it or how I mean to explain it in my, in my personal view is that some people are kind of giving up, you know, and they don't really need to. I, I've seen a couple of businesses that I, I wouldn't say they needed to. And that's sort of a sad thing to see. I think it's not, I mean, if there's a way you can um, keep things going and be creative, um, I think that that's a good thing. And it doesn't necessarily take a lot of people. Maybe there are a few people that you've kept and you, and you bring them in. You don't have to be alone. You can bring in outside people. You can uh, talk to other business leaders. I shared, shared with you, uh, you know, my CEO group is a great sounding board. They are not my board. Uh, they are um, a, a bunch of executives who have their experience and we think together. So I think don't isolate yourself is another thing that's really important um, that can help you maybe get out from your own, uh, your own uh, thought process. That's an excellent point. I mean, leadership can be lonely to begin with, but when things aren't going well, uh, it can be really depressing and uh, it can almost trap you. So I think that's an excellent point about getting out there and, and uh, not being isolated. Um, speaking of isolated, uh, the internet, we're all isolated in our homes. You know, I mean, it's, I know there are things we can do to, to meet with people and in this interview we're doing right now through Zoom, uh, we're, we're technically together. But um, how are you using data and, and how is your firm helping people do a better job of, of really reaching people in meaningful ways, given there's so much noise and there's so much activity going on right now on the internet? Sure, great question. So, you know, we do research and we do marketing. So we kind of connect the dots from doing our studies for our clients. And then on a side note to that, we're seeing really high participation rates at all levels within an organization. So if we're doing B2B, we're talking to senior level executives because they have more bandwidth and they want to provide feedback on what they're seeing. So, and you're probably experiencing a little of that yourself. Um, so, you know, we're finding um, really good information that will help our clients as they're thinking about going into new markets and validating whether those markets are viable or not through these advanced um, studies that we're doing. But the other thing is that um, we're seeing very dramatic shifts in terms of what is working digitally. So um, organic SEO is down a little bit, but um, retargeting it in terms of you know, the ads that follow you around has produced a huge uh, conversions and, and huge conversions in hospitality of all things. So those who have not given up in hospitality and are being scrappy, we're being scrappy with them and, you know, saying, okay, so let's test this. Let's take baby steps. Let's not um, spend a lot of money. Let's try other things. So I think the, the lesson here is to, to be agile, look at what's happening and um, to, to test things and be scrappy. So, yep. The other thing that we're doing is maybe what you're leading up to is the, the neural network. So we hired uh, a neural network engineer last year and we're um, helping our clients uh, be able to pinpoint more accurately, accurately um, a primary prospect versus an outlier. And right now, you, don't, you can't send your salespeople out in, the, out in the field. So if in real time, you're able to identify uh, a, real, uh, a real prospect versus somebody who you're gonna spend a lot of time um, uh, uh, turning your wheels, then we can help 
help our clients that way too. Um, I want to come back to something you said before, but now I'm curious, how much is that? <laughs> oh, that how much is the neural network? Yeah. Oh, so um, for when we set up our clients, it's pretty inexpensive. It's 3,500 to 4,500 to set up. Okay. And then how do you do that? Is it like so many, uh, after so many contacts that you've been able to vet? So uh, great question. In some of our clients' cases, we've gone back a number of years and looked at um, what customers have converted. And there's, an, there's, a, there's a quite a complicated explanation for how much of the decision science or neural network needs in order to make the uh, connections, if you will. Um, but it, we like to have a, a, a minimum of 5,000 names. So if it's a really small company, it probably is not going to be a good fit. Um, you know, we can, we can work with 1,500, but we like to have a bigger database. And there are certain elements within the CRM that we are looking for that help us identify, um, help the neural network determine who the prospect, uh, the best prospect is. Great. So, answer your question. It's kind of a personal question. I have clients that I might circle back to you on. Okay. In the upcoming months. So, um, yeah, we're piloting one for healthcare um, so that that patients stay within a specialty system um, so that the patient advisor is giving the patient the right information so mm -hmm. they can make the right decision in terms of their procedure um, and stay within the system. And then we have it on a B2C and a B2B level as well. So again, helping, uh, we just actually on Friday just sold another uh, deal to a manufacturer for the AI and they're in um, emergency care. So it, it's more about equipment sales on the emergency side. And so that their sales time sales team can spend the right amount of time with the right prospect. Great. Um, you mentioned before ads that follow us around, which used to creep me out. I used to think for sure I had gotten a, a cyber attacked. Oh. And somebody had put things on my computer and now they're forcing me to watch these ads. Um, you know, I'm kind of of the old guard where when all these things started following me around, I was like, ah, I've gotten used to it. Uh, yeah. so, and, and I know it's okay now. But um, it just makes me wonder what about what, what you're seeing out there in terms of generational changes with some of the, the older folks who are older than me. Uh, transitioning out of decision-making roles and how, how is that affecting marketing? Yeah, great question. So, you know, one of the things that we have seen is, as you said, people aging out, the baby boomers um, kind of leaving their roles. There's the Gen Xers or um, the Gen Yers who are entering some of these roles and they are looking first at the website. So if your SEO, your search engine optimization is not up to par, then you're not going to be found. And you should be able to be found on the first page of the search for the, the key services and products you offer. Um, and right now we're seeing uh, clients come to us uh, because they weren't set up correctly. And so that's something that's important. Um, the other thing is, again, to think about um, if you know what you're doing from a marketing perspective. So, you know, obviously people can't go to conferences and so you've got to be thinking uh, digitally of how you're going to get people to find you and get new leads that way. So that's, that's another big, big thing. Great. And then Liz, I wanted to ask you, I think you talked a little bit about it with the artificial intelligence and some of the other things that uh, we've talked about already, but how else have you change things with your organization and uh, what's the greatest challenge you're, you're still facing? You know, I think it's just the juggling act, you know, trying to uh, help our clients that are, um, that are in hospitality, help them uh, be scrappy, help them stay out there. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've done is I haven't made my clients stick to the contracts that we've established for the year. Um, we want to work with what can work and help them continue to think about ways to make money. So if it's a hospitality client, can they still sell weddings? Can they still sell, um, you know, private events? Maybe, maybe into, and you know, the fall of next year. So being cautious about any kind of marketing that's going toward those things. But also, you know, we are seeing that small family things are, are, are something that people are interested in doing and in a careful and thoughtful way in terms of, you know, keeping that protection, you know, with your, with your um, space, et cetera. So just, just seeing what's working, um, uh, promoting those businesses locally 
if they're based out of Miami, it's not going to make any sense to target target in um, Europe because they're not going to be coming to Miami. So again, being as um, agile as we can, that's one of the things that we're trying to do for our clients. And the same for my team. You know, we I'm coming into the office, but um, everybody has private spaces, and we're following the the um, best practices. And um, I'm not forcing anyone to come in. It's what what they're comfortable with. Yep. Uh, last question for you. Um, what should I have asked that I didn't ask? Oh, let's see. I think we talked about it lightly, but um, you asked me before how, how we're doing financially, and I'm okay to say that we're up 30%. Um, and again, I think it's because people are looking to make sure that their digital presence is there, but also they're investing in research. Um, we, we had uh, three new projects that we just were hired to do for three different companies on the research side, just making sure that you're uh, taking the right steps in the right markets with your marketing and, and growth investments or technology investments and validating those. I think that's really important. The other thing is I touched on before, and that is um, get out there and uh, talk to other people that have your best interest at heart and take care of yourself too. So that would be the other thing. That's well, a great note to end on. So thank you, Liz, for your perspectives today and, and for your time. Thank you. Thanks for including me. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. I also want to thank our sponsor, the Platinum Group, which for 40 years has helped companies during turbulent times such as these. If your company can use some advice or just a second opinion, you can learn more about the Platinum Group on the website, theplatinumgrp.com, or by calling 952 829 Five seven zero zero. Thank you to all of you for tuning in today. We'll see you next time on One Take.